Cars. Hi. I don't know whether everybody wants to introduce themselves. I mean, I'm Jerry, I'm in humanities and uh, yeah. I'm adjunct. And uh, of course, this is George Franz. <laughs> yeah. Hello, I'm uh, Raul Galope, I'm Spanish and Latino studies. Uh, and I'm in, um, uh, one of my fields is uh, Spanish Golden Age. So I'm oh. excited to, to hear about Calderon and life is a dream. Wonderful. Hello, um, I'm Vilana. I'm in uh, Dr. Galape's class, and I'm excited to be here and listen. Uh, and yeah, I'm a freshman at Montclair State, so. Thank you. Welcome. Jerry, should we wait a little bit or just jump in, or what's your preference? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess we could wait a minute or two, but I don't want to wait too long. <coughs> like I said, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, uh, I obviously don't have a compelling invitation method, you know, so, <laughs> so I should tell um, Raul and Bilana the, the uh, basis for the inv invite to George to speak on this is that I'm teaching Humanities 202, which is 1400 to the present. And, um, and I've obviously overwhelmed my entire class with other things and they're kind of ducking things left and right and maybe we'll not be turning up for this but <laughs> but I'll, I'll, we're recording it so I may be able to impress it upon them later <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, yeah and, and sometimes people they get a little late but or they might be joining as as we go yes. uh, I invited my class as well uh uh, actually, Bilana is here. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, while we're waiting, why don't I just basically uh, talk a little bit about how I met Calderon, got interested in Calderon. Uh, I was in graduate studies in theater at Columbia University. And, uh, oh. and so um, we were doing a unit on uh, classical theater, and we were actually doing a production of Calderon's uh, El Mayor Encanto Amor, uh, Love the Greatest Enchantment, which was the Odysseus and Circe story. So it was part of a, a thesis production for uh, the graduating class, and we were playing parts in that. So that was my first introduction to Calderon. We performed at La Mama Experimental Theater Club. It was directed by Andre Charbon, who's a, a kind of a uh, of enfant terrible of uh, the avant-garde theater and uh so I was, I was really fascinated with uh calderon's philosophical nature and uh how he would really in the midst of all of this really fantastic beautiful poetry um also really tackle great themes big big uh life universal themes and uh and so then I read uh, and was the stage manager for a production of La Vida de Sueño, but uh, the Comedia, so the 1635 version, which was basically the thing that established him in the court of, uh, of the king. And uh, his most widely known work, widely read work, people refer to it as the Hamlet of Spain. And uh, again, because of not only the um, the theme of royalty and loyalty, which is very, very big in, in Spanish golden age, but also the kind of the mistaken identity, uh, the discussion of predestination and free will that comes with the character of Segismundo. And then uh, also the, um, the idea of appearances that uh, we're never sure what we're looking at is, <coughs> Is it quite what we're really uh, thinking that we're looking at? And that comes very, very quickly in the beginning, even in the excerpt that I gave to you is they're looking at the tower in this 
cliff and they're wondering if their eyes are deceiving them or not. So these themes really uh, fascinated me. I, I loved um, the first play, the La Vida Sueño of 1635. And then uh, my teacher at Columbia University, uh, Nicholas Boltz, said, you know, Calderon wrote another one. Uh, and it's also called La Vida Sueño, and I said, wow, why would he do something like that? And he said, it's because uh, later on, he changed what his focus was, and at, many of you may already know this, but at age 40, between 40 and 50, Calderon became a priest, and uh, he changed his focus from the Comedia and the Cloak and Dagger stories uh, to what were the most popular form at the time, the auto sacramentales, which were usually done in praise of the, um, of the Eucharist and done on the Feast of Corpus Christi. They were much more popular forms. So people, while they would be, uh, while they would be performed in a theater and for the court, then they would also be performed for the public. And on these, you saw, if you saw the video, uh, these big uh, carros or these moving uh, wagons that would have scenery and would have places for people to perform. So it was big part of the, the spectacle, these autos sacramentales. And um, I, I said to, to, um, to Nikki, I said, well, why, why would he not change the title? Because when he rewrote his other plays, he would slightly change the title. Like, the first play that I meant to, mentioned, um, El Mayor Encanto Amor, or I Love the Greatest Enchantment. When he did the auto of it, he kind of kept the same storyline, but he called it Los Encantos de la Culpa, or The Enchantment of Sin, and to kind of uh, stress the, uh, the, the nature of it, the theological nature of it. But he kept La Vida Sueño the same, and I guess if you have a big hit, <laughs> you don't need any advertising if you keep the title the same. So, uh, but I was fascinated with it. Uh, I, I was looking for an English translation, could not find one. Finally, I called the Hispanic Society of North America and I got a very New York sounding person on the phone. And I asked if, if I said that I've been looking for this English translation of Calderon's auto of La Vida Sueño. And the person on the phone said, well, there's a reason why you can't watch find. that. And I said, well, what is that? No, it doesn't that. exist. So uh, a friend of mine, Alfredo Galvan, who was uh, also, we were in studies together. We decided that we would get together every week and uh, we would do a hundred lines at a time. And so we would just go through the play and we would translate a hundred lines at the time and we'd go back and forth. So the, uh, the translation that we have of the 1677 is really the only translation. Now, uh, this is for, for many, many reasons. I, I think Calderon was very prolific. And so you, you might say, well, why hasn't this been translated? Well, there are hundreds and hundreds of plays. So uh, Lope had thousands of plays. So uh, not every one of them was translated, but I always thought that this one ought to be because it was such a mirror to the, the first one. And um, you can see that in the short text that we sent out comparing the two. So I was fascinated by it. Um, I was very moved by it as well. Um, and there are a number of times that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that part of the journey, but... Uh, but yeah, the idea that uh, someone who was so successful as a theater practitioner would rewrite his old plays uh, was something that was fascinating to me. And I think what happened was he first was doing, the autos that he did first were the mythological stories. And he looked at the allegory of the myth in, and say was asking how could this serve the theology that he was interested in or the questions that he was interested in. Well, he ran out of myths <laughs> and then he turned to his own plays. And, um, and so we have his auto of La Vida Sueño. So that's a little bit about how I, I came to, to do this. In the year 2000, uh, I gave it its first English language performance at Marquette University. And then later at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, we were going to perform it in the, in the chapel of St. James, which is uh, 
called the Spanish Chapel. But uh, the rector of the cathedral, when he came to a rehearsal, he said, this is too big for that chapel. It has to be in the main space. And so we were very, very lucky to be able to perform it in that space. And, and it was magical. It was really, really tremendous. Um, we did it again in 2007 at Marquette, or sorry, at Fordham University, where I teach as an artist in residence. And then in 2014, I believe, or 2012, perhaps, uh, we did both plays on the same night at La Mama Experimental Theater. So we called the production Calderon's Two Dreams. And we did uh, a, a condensed version of the first La Vida Sueño, 1635. We took a break and then we did a condensed version of La Vida Sueño, 1677, the auto. Uh, and people were really struck by the parallels. People would have their favorites. Some would prefer one and not the other, and some would really uh, be more interested in one part of the story and, and not. But it, that really spoke to me as someone who does theater and actually inspired me that here's a piece of art that people can approach from so many different ways and have so many different reactions to. So, uh, so that's just a little bit about my journey with Calderon uh, to begin with. Uh, there might be a couple of questions. I know there are people coming in, so welcome to you if you're just joining us. We're talking a little bit informally about uh, Calderon de la Barca and his two plays, La Vida Sueño, the Comedia of 1635, and the Auto of 1677. So um, if there are no questions, uh, Raul, I'm, I may ask you to speak a little bit about uh, the golden age. Uh, since it's your specialty, I think I could say something, but I would feel intimidated with your Oh, presence. no, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, basically, um, this is uh, a period of in, in, in Spanish culture and literature in which uh, uh, basically um, it, it, it brings together the Renaissance and the Baroque as two periods, and especially the Baroque. And, and one of the preoccupations of the time is precisely that um, uh, split between appearance and reality, and especially in the context of, in, in a religious context, the context of the Counter Reformation of Spain, in which there is this. Um, uh, this this conflict between um, grace and salvation, and so basically most of the uh, the playwrights of the time deal with that that basic issue, the issue of how we get to save our souls in the context of this um, two two philosophies, the one about uh, free will and determinism, meaning are we already predetermined to be damned or, or, or saved, or are we, uh, we have to work towards that grace that will give us salvation. And that was, I would say, I always tell my students, that was such a hot issue at that time that is comparable to pr probably now the pro-choice, pro-life wars, cultural wars, those were the, the, the issues. They were really uh, at each other into these two philosophies. And precisely uh, the playwrights in Spain, they uh, were able to sort of present that conflict in a way that was uh, also controversial because if they were against, uh, let's say the main mainstreams of, of religion beliefs, they were even uh, accused of being uh, heretic and being uh, basically killed. You know? So, uh, so uh, that's one of the main issues that I focus on. And then, of course, there are other issues: issues of desire, issues of of. Uh, um, I, I normally, when I approach uh, Golden Age theater, I do it more from a. Um, psychoanalytical. I, I, I'm more interested in not so much in the religious aspects, but more in the, uh, the identity and, and subjectivities. So I think Calderon is also interesting in that, that split that he presents uh, about this character that has 
this perception of reality. I don't know if you want to go a little bit into the plot or something, but uh, Segismundo, who is uh, basically, if it's predetermined to be a tyrant and an unfit to be a king, which is what his father, the king, believes, or if he's actually a, a victim of his own circumstances. And so that is the conflict of, uh, and that's why he is imprisoned and he's, uh, he's allowed to come to, to um, for a moment to be tested as, as if he's, is, he could be uh, a king. And then of course, He's drugged. Uh, well, I I don't want to. I don't know if you want to go into the. Into yeah, the I, I I may touch into that later, but uh, that was a great uh, overview of of what were the concerns of a lot of the playwrights at the time of the Spanish Golden Age. Now, if I'm right, Calderon was at the end of the Golden yes. Age. Yes. Most people mark the Golden Age at around 1492, beginning with the Age of Exploration, and also. Um, the, the way that the Spanish Empire was built with the riches that were exploited from the New World. So the, there was a, a huge patronage system that evolved uh, based on that. But then uh, around the time of Calderon, when he was quite a young man, uh, there were four or five different wars going on at the same time. And uh, Spain was, was really depleted. Uh, financially depleted, a, a lot of the glory of the empire had been channeled into these the black hole of war, and and nothing came of it. So it it was almost, if I'm right, it was almost for those playwrights a way to hold on to a remnant of a culture of greatness, or a remnant of something that uh, that really professed their identity in a time when that identity was being challenged financially, politically, uh, and with all of the other changes that were going on in the world at the time. Yeah. Would that be fair? Absolutely. Actually, we consider that he died in uh, 1681, mm -hmm. and we consider the death of Calderon precisely the, 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 the end of the Spanish Baroque. Mm -hmm. uh, so it ends with him. And, and you are absolutely right. But he also had this problem that was a, a, a conflict of interests because on the, on, on the other hand, he was the official playwright for the court. Yes. And so um, at the beginning with, with Lope de Vega, which is one of the, the early ones, and then Tirso de Molina in the middle, and then finally Calderon, uh, he got all this spectacle, the possibility, he got to, to put it in, in today's terms, he got a lot of money to produce his plays. So he could go overboard. Mm. Whereas um, before they were a little bit more limited. And, and actually he did have super productions because he could use the, 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 uh, the palace the, and, and the outdoors. And so he could have, if there was a battle, he could have horses and, and soldiers fighting. So it was a super production of a play towards the end. It was almost an excess of, of the production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The idea of appearances, uh, the idea of, of what is reality, you know, features very much in the, uh, in the 1635, but then also definitely in the 1677. I was struck by um, the original the, the stage directions of the 1677, rather than saying stage directions or setting, it said uh, memoria de las apariencias. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a very, very strange uh, way of talking about how the stage is set and putting it in even to the word of appearances and, and, and memory and, and all of that. So, um, so it's described as very lavish and, you know, I, <laughs> I was a fool thinking I could stage this uh, when I, I was reading those stage directions. And I it, the first one said, uh, four carts come, one carrying air, one carrying earth, one carrying water, and one carrying fire. They fight over a crown that is in the middle of the stage. That was the very, very first stage direction. And, um, and so I was like, well, this is a great challenge. And uh, I, I enjoyed 
uh, going to it had a great production designer at Marquette, uh, Adam Stockhausen, who later on went to be the production designer for films such as the Grand Budapest Hotel and um, the, the French Dispatch most recently. But so, uh, so the visual was kind of pared down. We didn't have carts, but we really did want to go into the symbolic language of the spectacle and how the spectacle really opens it up. So um, Raul, you mentioned the, the plot line. Let me just give a, a brief overview of what the story for the 1677 or 1636 play is. Um, you may have seen that short video that uh, uh, Jerry sent out that had a little bit about the golden age and then a, a very tight recap of the 1635 play, but basically I don't know, I sent it out only to the uh, students in the class, but okay. I, can, um, I can put it into the chat. I'm putting okay. notes here anyway. Great, thank you. But basically, uh, the play begins, why don't we look at, um, at the, the two sections or the two things that I had given you. Is there a way to get that into the chat as well, Jerry, the, um, the two sections? The be in there. Um, if you if you scroll up a little bit, I think everybody was here. It says um, Sekis Mundo, yes, uh, thirty man seventy seven, and um, if you click on that, anybody who's here should be able to click on that and have a PDF come up. Great. So um, what I'd like to do for the bulk of what we're we're discussing today is just really take the to be or not to be speech of what would have been his, uh, his first play and how he uses it almost word for word in the second play, but he changes the circumstances around it and broadens the theology. So I might call upon some people who would like to read these scenes. Um, if you open the PDF, the first one begins with three characters, Rosaura, Horn, and Segismundo. So um, do we have any volunteers to read? I can read, I'm still popping up a noisy area, but I can read the first part. Okay, great. So um, why don't you read Rosaura? Yes. Um, uh, Jerry, would you like to read Horn? Okay, so Horn is Clarín. Clarín means bugle or trumpet. Uh, but in this translation, it's it's translated as horn. Uh, there's a lot more that you can do in terms of wordplay with horn than you can with <laughs> bugle, and uh, with very kind of body characters, there's uh, there's more reason for that. But basically, the very first uh, words of the play are Rosaura being thrown off a horse. And um, she calls it a detestable hippogriff and curses it that she's landed in this place of Poland and she's trying to uh, avenge her honor. She's disguised as a man. So Rosaura is now disguised as a man and they're stranded and they're looking in this storm upon the hillside. And this is what they see. So maybe uh, if you could begin with unless it's glare right there. Unless it's glare, it's, it's playing tricks on us. Those final rays of light point to a building. If the sun's dying fire hadn't hit is just right, you'd miss it. It looks so much like the cliffs around it. Let's see if anyone there will take us in. The door is open, though it's more like a gaping mouth, gaping mouth as if spawning the night from the abyss. Great. So already the idea of appearances is in the text they don't trust their eyes unless the sun hadn't hit it just right you wouldn't know it was a building you would think it was just a cliff the opening of the cave looks more like a mouth than it does so they're already going with that theme of of, of what is real what are appearances and and what are not so great uh they hear the sound of rattling chains from within what's this i hear heavens I can't move, frozen on, frozen and on fire at once. Ay, misero de mi, ay, infeliz. What a sad voice I hear. Now I struggle with the new pains and torments. And me with new fear. 
Horn. Miss? Let's fly from the horror of this bewitching tower. Flight or fright? So scared now I couldn't fly if I wanted. Over there, a brief light. Is that some faint glimmer in the darkness? And yet, doesn't that doubtful light make the shadow darker? Yes, I can see that this tome of prisons, prisons hold a light, a live, alive dead man. Don't move, listen. I, misero de mi, you heavens, I will not stop crying against you until you tell me what crimes I have committed in being born, though that is crime enough. But tell me, what more have I done that you punish me more? Weren't others born? Then why do they have other pleasures that I will never have? Why is it that the bird vested with plumes, scarcely born, goes with surpassing lightness and with great speed in that beautiful countryside, roaming the varied spaces in which it was born? But I, having more life, have less liberty. Why is it that the beast with its beautiful tint dappled hide, thanks to the adept brush that drew them almost like stars, is scarcely born and its footprint stamped when the cruelty of human need teaches it to be cruel, a monster in its own labyrinth? But I, with more instinct, have less liberty. Why is it that the fish that in the cold womb is born and lives in it like a silver-plated ship, a vessel with scales, with waves that give it grandeur as it plows the rambling wetness of such great immensity in union with its cold element. But I, who have more breath, have less liberty. Like a volcano, I spit out pieces of my own heart. What human law, justice, or reason could deny a human being those gentle benefits God gives fish and beasts and birds. Such thoughts make my heart tremble and ache. Who is that who hears my cries? Clotaldo? Just say yes. Just another sad person, a Demi, who, who grasps the echoes of your sadness. I'll kill you for that. You cannot know what I know, you who know my weakness. With my strength, I will tear you to pieces for having heard that. What? What did you say? I can't hear a thing. <laughs> if you were born human, then humbly placing myself at your feet is enough to free me. Your voice soothes me. Your presence upholds me. And your respect troubles me. Who are you? For although this tower is both my cradle and my grave, and though truly a prisoner where death lives and life is dead, I am not unlearned, having spoken to no one but one man. It is from him I know heaven and earth. The beasts taught me politics, the birds taught me caution, and the stars taught me all about going around in circles. But you, and only you, have made a place for passion apart from my anger, for belief apart from my eyes, and admiring from my ears. Each time I regard you, I hold you in higher regard, and my insane eyes keep looking, though looking makes me die. And insanely, I'd rather die than not look at you. If looking makes me die, what would not looking do? With amazement, I regard you. With regard, I hear you. Heaven led me here to console, to console me. If seeing one more unhappy can console, a sage tells a story of being so poor he had only grass to eat. Could anyone be sadder and poorer than I? Turning around, he saw another sage picking up the blades he threw away, complaining about my fortune, and asking, could anyone be more unfortunate? You sweetly responded, I think my sorrows would seem to seem joy to you if you were to gather them all up. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, it's such a poignant beginning. And the wordplay, uh, we, we struggled with the translation and we wound up doing our own adaptation based on about five or six different translations and how they dealt with the original text. And then there were certain things that we felt no translation was handling. So um, we would try to repeat words uh, that worked in English even though uh, there were different words that were repeated in Calderon's original, but we wanted to have the sense of um, the double meaning of certain words being echoed in, um, in some of the interchange. And uh, that almost creates this spiral of thoughts. And um, I find myself as I'm listening to it kind of wobbling in the middle of it, what, what's the sense of this one now? And what's the sense of that one? So from the very beginning of the play, he really creates this atmosphere of permeability of meaning and permeability of, of theme and, and need and desire. Um, there may be some, some questions or some comments from those of you who heard it. Well, I, I want to say that it's a fantastic translation. I mean, it's really, uh, it reads very well, uh, very good job. And, and it's very theatrical, which is what's more, most important because for many, many years, um, people treated golden age drama, which is, it, it's in verse, uh, same as Shakespeare. And, they treat it more like poetry than than a dramatic artifact, and 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 here you you capture the essence. It's a very good, very good work. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. Anything about the themes or about some of the some of the uh, ways in which they're dealing with appearances and illusion? Uh, with contrast of, of who this character of Segismundo is and uh, that really heartbreaking uh, testimony to what it is to be imprisoned. Uh, I think that's one of the things that really established the play more than anything, that monologue. Uh, and it's one of the most quoted pieces from it. Is could you say more about the use of the animals as a contrast and a kind of a compliment? Because he he says that he's pretty much learned everything that he knows from animals a, a, a little later, but but he also has this, um, I mean, it's it's like that's his one point of comparison of himself, you know? Um, so people understood humans as animals then, right? Like as a type of animal. And uh, I'm assuming that Calderon is is like thinking that way, but um, but is he like a different? I don't know. I mean, I yeah, no, it's great, and I, I think um, I think yes, everyone knows that the human being is an animal, but an animal of a special kind that has a soul and that has a reason and that has an understanding and has these other things that separate us from the rest of the animals. And that's, I think, one of the things theologically that's going on that makes this speech even more pointed. Um, we'll get to the other, the 1677 treatment of it, where I really push the envelope in that translation. And um, add a couple of things that Calderon uh, leans toward, but doesn't explicitly say, because I think a, a contemporary audience needs that kind of assistance to get into what he's saying, but you're right. So from this little prison, he has a very narrow window and he, he does nothing but watch. He listens to Clotaldo who instructs him and he has all of this, this kind of knowledge and uh, that way, but um, but really a lot of it is just looking out this window and wondering why he is in chains and everything out there is not. And that contrast is what's really heartbreaking and which is what uh, consoles Rosaura and gives her the, uh, the energy to continue. Later on, uh, we'll see in the play that there are circumstances that also make you wonder if fate is not on Rosaura's side 
and again, the idea of fate versus work and free will and de determinism and all of that. But um, so, but yes, he's looking at these animals and he experiences himself as an animal. He himself is called a beast by others because he is so rough. Uh, the prophecy about his birth said that he would become a beast, that he would be a tyrant and that uh, the way that he would or the, the destruction that he would bring would be so devastating. And so as, um, as uh, Professor Galope mentioned before, that was the reason why his father, Basilio, put him in the tower, was to save his people from this terrible tyrant. Um, the, we'll get into the, the finities of the rest of that comparison and Basilio's experiment and what that meant. And, that becomes a whole nature versus nurture thing. Uh, was Segismundo rough because of the prophecy or was Segismundo rough because he was imprisoned his whole, whole life? And uh, these are debates that we have about our own prison system today. You know, does, is the way that we're treating incarcerated persons contributing to the internalized violence that they have or, or how are we being responsible uh, with that? But let's look at the um, let's look at the second piece. Um, so this is labeled. Uh, oh my goodness! I don't think I have. Sixteen seventy-seven life. In yes. The... Yeah, oh, it's, it, it keeps scrolling down. It's there. Okay. All right. At least I can see it. <laughs> okay, let me. All right. It could be my relationship with Adobe is not a good one, <laughs> but let me let me just see. Okay, yes, yes, very good. So here we go. Now, interestingly enough. If we say that the plot line and the central question of Life as a Dream 1635 is uh, what is a fitting ruler? And the question, the particular question is, is Segismundo a fitting ruler for the kingdom of Polonia? Who Calderon becomes 40 years later is someone who's much more interested in the question that he asks in the auto, which is, is the human person a fitting caretaker for the earth. It's almost an ecological question. And uh, in a, a day when we're looking at uh, some of our rough treatment of, of the earth, and there are some beautiful passages that Calderon has that really call us to be more responsible with the environment. But uh, this question then, so it's no longer the court of Poland in 1677, now it's the court of the universe. And the question is, is the human being going to be the right caretaker for this? So um, as I mentioned, the 1677 piece begins with fire, earth, air, and water arguing over a crown. They're arguing over dominion in the universe. And they say things like, I must have that crown. The wreath must be mine, not while I live, not till I die. This bond between the four of us till now not divided will not be broken unless I reign. And then each of them gives these reasons why they should be the ruling element. Uh, they're, they're constantly in conflict. And then comes a voice from power, wisdom, and love, which is an allegory for the Trinity, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they say water, earth, fire, and air, who contrarily united and unitedly contrary, in struggle you are, be divided. They ask who commands us? Power, who, who, uh, who, who made it all from the beginning. Wisdom, who seeing the, uh, the, the differences between them made it so. And love, who calls them to be, uh, to be united. So they see, power, wisdom, and love as three distinct beings who can get along in, in harmony, and they're not coerced in submission. They're not put down in, into submission. 
they are embarrassed into submission. And they say, if these three distinct persons can get along, then we have to submit. We have to let go of our fight and we have to see that this is a better way. So power says uh, that the, the human person will be the one that is overall creation because the elements say we need someone over us, otherwise our fight will continue. Power says, I'm gonna make the human person that viceroy, the one to look over you. However, I'm not so sure I should do this. I had some trouble with my last creation, that beautiful angel, <laughs> Lucifer. And, um, and then he talks about how the battle of the angels happened. And so power wants to know if this is going to happen again. And so power asks wisdom, is this, is this what's going to happen? And wisdom says, I know everything. And if you make the human person, if you give breath to man, at this point, man is just a lump of clay. He's not, he's formed, but he has no animation yet. Uh, if you allow man to do this, then there will be no worse person over them. Uh, everything will be brought in, greed, uh, anger, rage, and the list goes on and on of, to all the things that the human being will, will happen. And so, but then love intervenes. And um, let me see if I can, um, if I can just get that place in uh, love's speech. Uh, so yeah, power asks if, uh, if, if love thinks it's wise, love doesn't deny any of the dangers, but says this, those menacing risks are not power so definitive that they must be so. So there's the determination or free will. And yet they will not limit man's own will, nor the merits of his virtues, nor the demerit of his vices. If all of this magnificent work in which I admire fire its brilliance, in air its clarity, in water its progeny, as much as the richness of the earth, if for man you made it all, and if it is man who owes you the work of these six days, then wouldn't it be discordant with a pious love to make this for man and not to make man? If the five talents which you give him will be the five senses, if you give his soul three powers, one reason, one judgment, then allow understanding with its rational impulse. Uh, I just lost it here. Oh dear. I did a little flick and it was gone. Yes, okay. Then allow understanding with its rational instincts to point out to him the good and the evil giving him a free will, which he may use well or ill. Now, this is one of the things when I was translating it that blew me away is this next, uh, this next discourse. Man has already been conceived in your supreme thought, but he is not yet as you have thought him to be. Therefore, allowing man to be without being is to give a deserved punishment before the wrongdoing. Yet there could be no reason to punish if man does not yet even exist. And thus, as love, I beg you, let man be born. And let man know that this empire and your kingdom, he must win or lose by himself. A tremendous advocacy on the part of love for the human being. Uh, and so with that as a background, let's then go into uh, the next reading between grace and, uh, and man. So now grace is about to release man from the prison of non-being. 
uh, not the prison of the tower. So they're using the same language with Segismundo. And, uh, and now we see a little bit more in this. So if, uh, if someone would read Grace, that would be great. Okay, Mary, thanks. I think your microphone might be off, but... Um, I think I just unmuted. Can, okay, great. can you hear me? Yep, yep. Yes. So um, why don't you take Grace? I'll take Man. Okay. Man, image of your author, break from your shadowy prison at the voice of your creator. What sounds I hear, if this is hearing? What brightness I see? If this is seeing, while even now, passing from non-being to being, I know no more than not knowing what I am, what I was, and what I will be. Follow this light, and you will learn from it what you were and what you are. But whatever you will become in the future, be it bad or good, that you alone can learn. Full of a thousand confusions, I follow you. Oh, how clumsy my first steps are. Confused but aware. Already you are born aware and aware of your freedom. But why? If this beautiful light with the majesty of its clarity can run over blue hills, then why do I, who have more soul, have less freedom? Why is it that the bird with vested plumes, scarcely born, goes with surpassing lightness, roaming the spaces in which it was born, but I, having more life, have less freedom? Why is it that the beast with its beautiful tint dapple hide is scarcely born and its footprint stamped by the creator when it can run in one course or another, but I, with more instinct, have less freedom? Why is it that the fish that in the cold womb is born and lives in it, plowing the rambling wetness of such great immensity, but I who have more breath have less freedom? If seeing how awkward man is in his creation and aware of how his reason stumbles where his own foot has stumbled and still not knowing who I am, who I was, and who I will be no more than what I saw or heard, then let me be returned, entombed in this crag, this crag, imprisoned by the earth rather than by awareness, so my author may have mercy on me. He will have mercy. And though you are in a kind of sleep, your senses without sense, you will be transformed, led by my light to a royal palace where everyone will give you a fit will give you fitting applause. The musicians sing, come, oh man, come. Grace will carry you, but do not turn out her light so you may know good and know evil as well. So we see how he takes the kind of the central beginning of uh, his most famous play and just completely flips the circumstances and uh, really goes to a much deeper level of if, if you thought you couldn't get any deeper than that first discourse at all. He succeeds in doing that, and and that just blew me away. Do you, do you think uh, that that is somehow um, connected to this uh, concept of grace and uh, uh, precisely the idea of uh, sufficient grace versus efficacious or, or, or effective grace, uh, and that brings the idea of free will right are we born already under the grace of being saved or we have to work for it and repent which was the idea of, of um and that was a, the topic of like even don juan uh, is the mm -hmm. whole idea of salvation damnation because you had to repent so do you think that that is a little bit present there or or you see it more like um mm -hmm. in terms of uh Platonic or Plato's idea of, of the cave and the idea of the misconception of reality through shadows. I think Calderon is definitely going into Plato and definitely doing that, but he's also engaging the, 
dialogue about grace and, and what that was. Now, um, just a little bit of background theologically, the way that I describe it is grace is like the energy by which we are able to do the good that we do in the world. So all the good that we're able to do is because we already have the fuel of grace, the energy of grace. And in Christian belief, this is a free gift that is given to us by God. And um, the dialogue between power, wisdom, and love alludes to that, that love is asking that that would be given to man. Now, um, we say that because uh, the human person is fallen in sin, we needed, uh, in Christianity, we needed a savior. And so Christ's redemptive act by taking all of the sins of the world on himself and bringing it to the cross, trusting in the love of the Father, uh, that, that God would not abandon him, and then with the resurrection, uh, receiving new life, the belief is that Christ has conquered death by death, that Christ has taken all of the evil of the world and brought it to an instrument of evil that the world has inflicted upon him, and by that has transformed it into a means of giving grace, which is sacramentalized in the Eucharist, and all of the auto sacramentales were about the Eucharist. So at the very end of the play is basically how this whole story will point to that gift of Christ. So the idea of grace here is not, uh, we tend today to kind of boil things down to, are you saved or are you not saved? And fundamentalist uh, Christianity, there are strains of fundamentalist Christianity that says all that you need to do is accept the Savior, and you are saved no matter what. And then there are other forms of Christianity that say that you really need to work at it, and salvation is not guaranteed. But but you have to, kind of the middle term that Catholicism speaks about today is that we have to participate in grace. We have to participate in redemption, so that there is a sense of an already thing that has been given to us, but there's also a sense of a not yet, which is yet to be fulfilled by the union of our action, our desire, our disposition with all of that together. And that's exactly what grace is saying to man. The only, the only way that you'll know it is by what you do. I will accompany you. I will bring you light. And, and grace carries the light for man so that by grace, man can see the way. But as soon as power and temptations and other things come in, man then loses the way. Does that answer the question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good. I see a, a student. Uh, is it Gina? Yes. Yeah, it's Gina. Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted, just let me know if I got this completely wrong, but I just wanted to know, like, could grace also be interpreted as like a form of enlightenment? Because when you, while you were reading this, that's totally what I got from it and that the picture from the encyclopedia of like the angel with the sheath that's exactly like what came to my mind as uh uh the man was saying his big speech so because it sounds it just sounds like to me how people are being enlightened and everything so could that also be interpreted as that absolutely of course the philosopher would then ask and what is enlightenment so, so it would go further into that. Uh, and the fact that grace uses the name light as the same way really points to that genus. So that is, that's very, very astute in saying that. Uh, when we, or when I hear the word enlightenment, I tend to think of it as a kind of a rational thing or a mental thing. And I think with, um, with the ancient cultures going all the way back to Judaism, uh, the place where the heart or the place where the mind was, was not the head. The mind lived in the heart in Judaism. And so uh, that strain comes through Christianity, Catholicism, so that it's not just enlightenment of mind or enlightenment that we, we might think of in terms of the Buddhist sense of a, a rational or a perspective. It's also a complete makeover. So it's not just my mind, it's my heart, it's my spirit, it's my desire. Everything is transformed by the light of grace. So I would say yes and more. 
Uh, Jerry, you also had a question? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of linked actually, but um, I was wondering about, as I expected, um, because man was going to be born and the decision was made not to kind of torture him the way that Segismundo was tortured, it surprised me when man was asking, you know, why do I have less freedom than the birds and so on? It's, it's almost as though he was born imprisoned somehow, but I guess Grace is trying to tell him th that, um, that, it's a, that it's a kind of, um, it's a, a kind of prison that he can break out of himself. I don't know. Well, and, and that's where I got a little bit heavy with the translation. What Calderon seemed to be saying in this was that man's awareness was his prison. So that it's a two-edged sword, that my awareness of, of the world and my awareness of seeing everything, but knowing of my own limitations, knowing where my foot stumbles, knowing how my reason stumbles, wanting to ask these questions, who am I, who was I, who will I be, and having no answer is a kind of a cognitive <laughs> prison that the animals don't have. So that the bird is free to just fly around because the bird is not saying, who am I? What am I going to become? Uh, but man, man is. Uh, man lives in that, the human person lives in that. And while that is a way to enlightenment, while that is a way to answer questions, it's also a way of um, recognizing how limited we are uh, by the fact that we have the awareness to even ask and that um, we're never going to get reasons that are completely satisfying. So it's, it was a real mind bender for me to kind of see that that's what Calderon is equating the prison for. At the end, when he says, let me be entombed in this crag of imprisoned by earth rather than by awareness, that my author might have pity on me. I'm muted, sorry. I, I, I agree, but I also think that um, in, the con in the conception and especially from the mystics, the whole idea of the body is perceived as a prison because yes. it, 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 it has the soul inside and the soul cannot be liberated uh, because suicide is not an option. And also um, that's when Santa Teresa also said, I die because I cannot die. So mm -hmm. um, that concept of living in this prison and not being able to be liberated because the only way to get the soul to God would be through death and death is not possible unless the Lord decides. Uh, so I think it, it also has a little hint of, of that probably. Yes. Now um, let's go back to the first one, the 1635 piece where Segismundo is prophesied to be this tyrant, is raised in a tower. And then uh, the king comes to a point, King Basilio comes to a point where He's, he realizes that he needs to have a succession plan, that the next ruler needs to be named. So the two kin that are in, in line are Astolfo and Estrella, who are cousins. One is the Duke of Muscovy, the other is, is a, a royalty. And um, they're right now they're vying for the throne in the same way that earth, air, fire, and water were vying for the crown. So that's another parallel that Calderon does between these two. Uh, Basilio explains to them why he imprisoned Segismundo because of the prophecy. He wanted to protect the people because he was prophesied to be such a terrible tyrant. But then he feels, well, what if? So he almost has that idea that love has. Is this to give a deserved punishment before the wrongdoing? That question is what Basilio asks himself. And so he comes up with this schema 
which then becomes the whole idea of the dream. What is a dream? So we're going to take him and we're going to put him on the throne. The, when he wakes up tomorrow, he will be drugged. We'll take him in his drug state. We'll put him on the throne. He'll, he'll wake up in royalty. And then when he says, but what about that tower that I was in for all of this life? Then um, the, the people in the palace are instructed to say, that was only a dream. That wasn't real. That was just a dream. So that he can, they can begin to see what he would be like on the throne. Well, of course, um, the difference between being imprisoned and being completely given complete license and the way that rulers are given complete blank check with everything, uh, he abuses his power and Segismundo does, in fact, kill a servant. He uh, tries to violate Rosaura. Uh, he, he tries to do all kinds of other things. So they say, no, he is a tyrant. We put him back in, in the tower. So when they put him back in the tower, he wakes up in the tower and he says, wait, wasn't I just on the throne? And then they say, oh, no, that was a dream. <laughs> so, so these two things of what is the dream and what is the reality in Calderon's 1635 Comedia, Life is a Dream, are really embellished in that way. Now, how Calderon deals with that in this one is after, um, after the human person proves to be someone who just seeks his own will. He's given free will and understanding, and they're the vaudeville characters. They're the comic characters. Understanding is always saying, you know, be careful, don't do this, don't do that. And free will is saying, go ahead, do it, do it. And so that's kind of the comic relief that you would expect from uh, one of Calderon's plays. But uh, what happens is uh, the Prince of Darkness and Shadow become very jealous of the human person because they don't want anyone else in charge of creation. They would like things to remain the chaos that it is right now where they have free reign. So they decide to come up with a way where they can trick man into letting go of his birthright, birthright by, um, by disobeying the order of good and uh, by kind of overturning all of the created world. So once man disobeys, uh, earth, air, fire, and water re revert to their fight and the elements are at, at war again, and there are hurricanes, and there's earthquakes, and there's tidal waves, and there's all of these things that happen. Um, now, that's a really wonderful moment. It was one of the most arresting things when, when I did it. In the same way that Segismundo killed that servant by throwing them off the balcony, the parallel in the 1677 is, um, man is getting a little annoyed with understanding and uh, is very enamored with free will and basically says to understanding, you better watch it or I'm going to throw you off. Understanding says to man, you couldn't do that without destroying yourself. Man takes that as a challenge and a dare and as foolish people often do with dares say, well, yes, I can. I can do it and I'll show you that I could do it. Free will, come help me throw him from this cliff. So free will says, yes, I will, for without me, you cannot do it. So they take understanding, they throw understanding away. All of creation, fire, earth, air, water, everything, everything says, what have you done, oh man? And man says, gotten rid of my understanding. <laughs> and uh, when we staged it, I asked the actor that was playing man, I said, okay, so what's going to happen is you're going to say that line and you're going to hear a reaction in the audience, but you have to create a space for that reaction to happen. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to, to start at the upstage right of the stage. You're going to make a very long dramatic cross to the downstage left part of the stage while you're saying the line gotten rid of my understanding. And when you get to the end of that line, you're going to stop in your tracks and listen to yourself and think, did I just say what I think I said? 
And then you're going to push on because you just want to do what you want to do. And then you continue the cross. So putting that piece of staging in gave the audience the moment to really allow that line to hit and makes it really clear that at that point, man has rejected grace. Man has gone with his own desire. Man has rejected understanding. He goes with his own selfishness. And we see in the world today where selfishness gets us. You know, sometimes there's an illusion of success, but everything that's happening in the war right now is complete selfishness, complete and utter foolish, misguided, egotistical selfishness. Um, but so, so man is then taken into a place which resembles the prison that we saw in the 1635. Man's placed in chains, uh, man's placed in a dungeon, uh, but the chains, these chains are forged by his disobedience. And so the parallel really, it begins with awareness in a kind of a metaphorical or a, 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 a kind of a symbolic level, but then it becomes very practical is once we can't use our awareness or once we have rejected the good use of our awareness, we then forge for ourselves the chains of our own consequences. We then forge for ourselves the chains of our own, um, the repercussions of our own foolishness and our own actions. And so, um, so man is, is disabled by that. So a very long answer, um, Raul, to the complexities of what that prison becomes for him. There may be some follow-up questions to that or other thoughts, places where I completely lost you <laughs> because it's, uh, it is such uh, intricate material that we're dealing with. But any, any questions at all about it? Uh, Jerry? Uh, I just wanted to say, it seems like a very dark vision of, of humanity. Um, partly because I'm still struggling with this idea that, that, that man gets, gets born in, in prison essentially. And so the idea that, um, I mean, the nature versus nurture in me, the, the, like I'm very much like a nurture versus nature person. <laughs> and, and so, uh, so like understanding that man's grown up in this, in, in this uh, under adverse circumstances and then is being held to this standard and, and, and obviously is not going to stand up to it um, and obviously is not going to win um, and then gets punished afterwards for not winning is, it, it just feels very, um, it's, it, it's kind of like heading in the, in the um, more in the predetermination direction for me than not, you know. And Calderon always teeters on both because he wants to, like a good dramatic playwright, he wants to show the consequences of each view. So if we're in predetermination, this is what it means. If we're in grace, this is what it means. And so the, the story does not end with man in chains. That's only the middle of the story. And it goes on from there. But let's go back to the idea that man in the 1677 is, is born in a prison. Man calls awareness a prison, but is awareness only a prison? What do you say? I mean, uh, I think great grace was sort of implying that it's that it's not that it's the only the only way that you can actually find your path is the fact that you've got that awareness and that's a good gift. But um, great. But man misinterprets. Well, yeah. Yeah, Grace says, confused but aware. Already you are aware and aware of your liberty, aware of your freedom. So, so Grace is saying, yes, by this light, look at it this way. But man is saying, but I'm feeling something else. I know you're telling me it's a gift, but it feels like something else. Now, a whole lot of the play that we haven't described or we haven't con considered makes it much lighter. 
and the elements serve him and they give him gifts. And he's, he's given uh, the ability to choose right and wrong. And the choices are laid out. Understanding says you can do this. Free will says you could do this. So it's not so clear that man is predetermined in his choices. What Calderon does with, two, with those two characters is makes one of them seem on the surface very glamorous and on the other side seemingly on the surface very tedious. But then what happens later is man recognizes that what seems tedious is actually the most compassionate. What seemed tedious is actually the most free. What seemed tedious is actually the, the, the clearest road to liberty and to freedom. And what seemed attractive in free will was actually a lot of noise that needed to be sorted out. So man comes to that, agree, that recognition later on when man finds man's self in chains. Um, and, and, and I would say that uh, in terms of that, yeah, it's gloomy, it's dark, but at the same time, um, it reflects this idea, which it comes with, with the, the time in Spain, right? This idea of dissolution, this idea of Spain having to undergo all this split between being a power and a world power, but then being poor inside because of all the well the black legend and also all the 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 the, the wars that, that Spain fought so I think that 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 explains a little bit of that that pessimism but but and 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 I think that um, if we compare to other movements and other moments in history I mean it's also existential uh, there is a, a, some existentialism there which is also pessimist uh, pessimistic and 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 we're all subjects to something else right in a way um, I, I I think that it reflects that human nature um, and that makes it contemporary, I think, right? That you can stage it and still speaks to modern audiences. I mean, contemporary audiences. Yeah, and I think it it becomes a little bit more clear uh, what Grace's role and what power, wisdom, and love's role is is after man is taken away to be placed in prison. Uh, power, wisdom, and love then have a conversation, which is a mirror image of what St. Ignatius of Loyola talks about in the spiritual exercises of the conversation of the Trinity as they're thinking about how to bring salvation to the world. Mm -hmm. And so I I'm, I'm just want to read that section for you. So um, power notices that love is moved to compassion as they carry man away in chains. And power says, you still show yourself tender love? Love replies, who doubts that love will always be love. And although your judgment is just, his appeal is also just. That if in the celestial court it is decreed that man echo the choice of the fallen angel, then he, he ought to also be able of making amends. Power says, and this is where the theology and the philosophy teeters, the insult against power is infinite. And man cannot give a satisfaction, oh sorry, the insult against infinite power is infinite. And man cannot give satisfaction as infinite because man is finite. Wisdom then says, still the will of us three, power, wisdom, and love, the will of us three is one. And if power puts forth his own, if wisdom puts forth the effort with obedience and love puts forth the work, then there is one who will make amends and take the place of man's insufficiency. For humanity joined with wisdom, humanity and divinity, in hypostatic union, that is Christ's divinity and Christ's humanity together, the infinite guilt will have infinite satisfaction. So the idea is that because power is infinite, to insult power is an infinite offense. Because the human person is finite, there cannot be an amends that is made. 
So here's where the idea of the hypostatic union of humanity and divinity coming together in the person of Christ and why that was so celebrated in this. It had to happen because in order to make up for the infinite offense, someone who was infinite, in this case, wisdom, the second person of the Trinity, the son, freely chooses to become a human being so that humanity and divinity could be acted. So that anything that Christ would do, anything that wisdom incarnate would do, would be both infinite as divine and human, and therefore tied to the offense of man. It's a lot to wrap your, your mind around. And um, when people watch this play, they say, that was like a four-month theology course in an hour and a half. <laughs> So because it, it deals with all of that. Now, that might take a little bit of unpacking before we go on. But is, is that clear, basically, or that premise? Is that clear? Yeah. I think I'm. Um, I think I'm still. Well, <laughs> there's a lot in there that I'm not following, obviously. But um, but the the fact that the offense is infinite, and so the response has to be infinite, seems clear to me. Um, like in a in a way, <laughs> but um, but it also seems odd to me that that humans are at the center of this kind of maelstrom. You know, like that that somehow um, human, human free will and, uh, and, um, and understanding are going to put all of this together in such a way that it comes out all right. I mean, because, I, I mean, it just seems like, that seems like a, a lot to ask, you know? I, I, mean, I mean, because because all of the other forces are, are sort of like, a, you know, if you just look at it in a pagan way almost, it's just like there, there are God forces out there doing all this stuff. And then there's just humans who happen to have a finite life and finite amounts of wisdom and power and love. And, uh, you know, like, where does that, How's that going to to work? As a, as a how is a human going to become a good king that way? You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, by grace would be Calderon's answer. Uh, by grace, and because I have grace, then I I listen to the balance, and what happens at the end, the antipathy between free will and understanding is resolved in the end where at the end, free will and understanding decide we need to work together. Um, we need to, to go into this. Now, um, I will skip ahead perhaps and read a little bit of what happens to man in chains and when free will comes back uh, and all of that. So um, let me see if I can get there in a moment. So, uh, so man is in chains, and recognizes what has happened. Shadow, who is the one who tricked man into disobeying the commandment, presenting him with poisoned fruit, complete Adam and Eve, complete Garden of Eden, but it's using a symbol, Calderon's using a symbol that is readily accessible to everyone of his time so that they would understand what this disobedience means. Um, shadow is trying to convince man that any pleasure or any delight or any grace received from God was the dream. And that the darkness that you're describing, Jerry, is what Calderon is saying, that's what shadow would have us believe life is. But what the reality is, is man sees something else. Now, basically, uh, man comes to the conclusion and says, uh, and uses his awareness and reason to get out of it. Man says this, 
Now I see by that courteous delusion, you are the one for whom my raving, applauding my free will, made me throw off my understanding. Shadow says true. Now, because shadow says true, then man understands that that really did happen, even though shadow is saying it didn't happen. So then man says, well, then that was not a dream. And then shadow flumbers and falters and does all kinds of mental gymnastics says, oh, well, yes, yes, it was for what good fortune having passed is not dreamed. Again, philosophically trying to get man away from the idea that grace or favor or delight is any part of this world. Then man answers uh, the question, what good fortune having passed is not dreamed? Man says, that which indeed has passed. One can see in hindsight the difference between certainty and falsehood. One has not been, another has, even if it ceases to exist. And now, because I know it is true, that even in this state, chains and punishment and responsibility, that I am prince and heir to a kingdom, and that majesty will was not a dream, I will go claim it. So man is inspired by the possibility of knowing who he was. And, um, and then man says, if I might ask for breath from power who raised me, who would not, saying exactly what you're saying, Jerry, who would not have overthrown his understanding in that fight? So man is acknowledging that. And then once he says that, understanding comes back and says, what does it matter that you overthrew me since I do not die? And since my only wish is that you would heed me in any conflict, man is moved by his, his loyalty. Shadow says, what does it matter to my enterprise if man cannot uh, take back his understanding or his free will? Man is worthy or unworthy without it. Then here's the thing. Understanding says, call free will and he will come. Man says, he will not want to obey me. Free will actually abandoned man once things turned, turned bad. For his is an unfaithful service. Here's the point. Understanding says, even if he does not want to, in the same way that he drew you to him, you can draw him to you. Or if you say the word, I will bring him in by dragging him. <laughs> So basically what that means is the way that free will kind of presents options before our eyes is exactly the same route whereby we look at the options that are presented to us. And so it, it might seem, yeah, do it. It's what I call um, contemporary society wanting to take out the pause for reflection between stimulus and response. I think in a lot of ways, contemporary culture wants to take out the pause between stimulus and response, wants automatic, automatic, and so we're left only with consequences. What understanding is saying is, I am the pause. And by the same way that you could follow him, you can pull free will to you by that same power, by the power that is given to you, if you exercise it, if you do that. And then when understanding says, or I will pull him in by dragging, that's basically um, what we say is that rationality has the power to mitigate our perception. Rationality has the power to mitigate our emotional response. Rationality has the, has the power to counsel us in that pause of deciding what my choice is going to be. So understanding is basically saying, that's my job. So let me do my job. Let me do my job and I will bring free will back. Now, this is something that in a, a course that I was teaching at, uh, at Fordham, I was going over um, some of the, uh, there, there uh, a psychologist can't remember his name, I think it's Eslin, talks about 10 irrational beliefs, 
that people, if they continue to, um, if they continue to live in these irrational beliefs, they're in a, a spin cycle. And then he, the psychologist talks about the 10 ways of challenging or intercepting those irrational beliefs. And so uh, the student, after hearing this for a whole semester, said, so you're basically saying that we can use our reason to work with our emotion? I said, yes, yes, we can. I don't have to do simply what I feel. I can consider what I feel. And I can consider the multiple things that I feel. And then with my rationality and envisioning consequence, in envisioning what the results will be, in envisioning what the courses will be, in envisioning what uh, any of the outcomes will be, I can use my rationality to sift through these conflicting feelings to decide which one I will follow all the way through. So that's what's happening in this interchange between free will and understanding at this point. Again, really a lot. Um, any follow-up to that? I know we're almost at time, but, uh, but if you want the discussion to go on, Jerry, I think you have some, some leeway or? Um, yeah, we're, I mean, we can, we can continue if people have, have questions. Um, I'm, um, I'm just thinking. <laughs> no, <That's good. laughs> I, I, I have a, a quick question, but it's probably taking you away a little away from the religious uh, uh, question because, I mean, we explore it uh, very well, I, I think. But the other side of that divided, uh, some people call it the split plot of the comedia, right? Um, the other side is the political one, is the one that has to do with succession, how to access power, and and if he was um, a legitimate uh, heir to the tr throne or not, and then the the cousins, etc. So, since you are obviously uh, as a, as a company, you did a, an excellent job of bringing this work to contemporary visions, visions and sensitivities. Did you address also that uh, political aspect of the play and, and how? Yes, it was much, it was much easier to, uh, it was much easier to address in the 1635 aspect of the play. Mm -hmm. And um, basically uh, there's um, a revolution where once Basilio, in 1635, put Segismundo back in the tower, then it's clear that Astolfo, the Prince of Muscovy, is going to be on the throne of Poland. So we see even in the 17th century, no one wants Muscovy on the throne. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I, I, as a Ukrainian, I couldn't help but say that. Uh, but so, so the people of Polonia, the people of Poland, reject Astolfo. And they go to the tower, having seen Segismundo, having known that he really exists and that he is the rightful heir, they free him from the tower and they overthrow Basilio's army and put him back in power. Now, what, but what is the transformation point for Calderon in 1635 is that because of all that Segismundo has gone through, because of going back and forth and really seeing demonstrated consequences for action and, and all of these things, having kind of dealt with it with the distance of what if this was a dream, what if this were a dream, and then is allowing himself to consider that he becomes a much better ruler in the course of just a few days. And when Sigismundo is put on the throne again, becomes very magnanimous uh, for, you know, and, uh, at the end forgives Clotaldo, who is the, the leader of the army, because he was only obeying the king. And at this point, this is the political, by rights, uh, you, you must obey the king. But then he imprisons the revolutionaries. And that's where the political twist in the six, from the, the um, 1635 play 
is such an upset ending um, on many levels because those were the conventions of the time and being tied to the court, he had to write that. But the utter absurdity of imprisoning the people that freed him must have been such a dramatic upset that it brought the question to the forefront. Mm -hmm. So in that way, 1635 is built in. In terms of the 1677, the politics are mitigated by the politics of forgiveness. And, uh, and basically what happens is, as we said, the second person wisdom chooses to become a man, chooses to uh, be seen, comes across man in his chains. Man cannot break the chains. Free will cannot break the chains. Understanding cannot break the chains because they're forged from the infinite fault. Wisdom, who is incarnate now and who is a man, man says, these are the chains that I have forged from my own disobedience. Wisdom sees this and says, he cries and confesses. There is nothing to hold back my, my mercy. And again, that is all, in, in, in true theology, the only thing that we need to ob obtain mercy is to confess that we've done wrong. And then mercy is available. That's the doctrine of grace. And that's what is there. Some of us would rather not have mercy and be right, <laughs> but, but it's not a, a big price to pay to say I was wrong to obtain forgiveness. Now, now uh, then wisdom goes over, and as soon as wisdom touches the chains on man's hands, they fall from his hands. And, um, and this, is, this is the power of forgiveness, that forgiveness breaks our chains. This is when I, uh, I'm going to get very weepy right now. When I was reading the original and I got to this line, um, tears welled up in my eyes as they are doing now. Because after man is freed from that by, uh, by wisdom, wisdom picks up the chains and addresses the audience and says, once and for all, oh man. Put your prisons in my hands. And the idea is that we construct our own prisons constantly because we would rather be right than ask for forgiveness. We would rather be justified than admit we need to be reconciled. But then what wisdom does is saying, but I will go it one further. And then wisdom puts on the chains so that wisdom will appear to be man, to shadow and the prince of darkness when they come back, because shadow and prince of darkness want to destroy man. Basically, wisdom says, I will take them on, I will appear as man, so they will destroy me and not man. And when they come and they try to strike wisdom, of course, wisdom doesn't die because wisdom is infinite. And then that is the redemptive act. That is the cross. That is uh, salvation because of, of what Christ has done. So wisdom takes on that and consents to accept death at the hands of shadow and the prince of darkness in order to do that. Um, just the last things that I would kind of talk about how the politics, the, the politics of, of the royals are overturned by this last version. At the end, um, power looks at, uh, at man and wisdom and love are around him. And at the very, very end of the play, they address him and uh, they say this. Uh, Man, made in my own image, I drew you from the earth. In a royal palace, I placed you, lost by your disobedience. To the earth you returned, and I returned to look for you in it, where covered by my grace, I desire grace to be your spouse. Then power says, look how much is owed me says, look how much it cost me. And love says, look how much I love you. Mm. 
And so that is the kind of the universal overturning of the political expectations. That through that act of love, it's already, it's a different economy. It's a completely different economy. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. That was great, yeah. So it's a, it's a kind of a stop and go theology lesson in the course of this very mythical, elemental, epic, cosmic battle. Yeah. And, and yet it's, uh, it also opens the opportunity for other approaches. You could go into a psychoanalytical approach in which you see, you know, the subconscious forces and the superego and, and, and how those two forces oppress or create this subject that is chained to his own representation. I mean, there, there are so many ways of approaching the play, which mm. that it makes it really interesting. And, and another funny thing, or it's not really funny, it's, it's tragic, but it's one of the, I, I think it's the only play that I can think of where the comic relief character Horn, Clarine, dies. Yes. And, uh, normally the comic relief, which is the gracioso, in Spanish we call it gracioso, which is the character that is the one with the asides, the one who, who, who provides the laughter, right? When, when the tension is high, they always end the play with a final saying or something like that asking for the audience uh, mercy and, and mm. gratitude, et cetera. And, and, and here, you know, he precisely because, well, I don't know how you interpret his death, but uh, um, in a way he's trying to escape death and he cannot. Right, right. So again, um, Calderon is teetering back and forth. He's just made this whole case for free will. Mm -hmm. And now with Clarine's death, he teeters back to determinism. So because Clarine was destined to die and tr tried to escape death, he could not escape death. So as a dramatist, he's constantly flipping back and forth and sees no need to come down on one side of the argument or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are many approaches that you can take. And one of the most delightful things that came out of the La Mama production is of all the press that we got about it, uh, one of my favorite was Scientific American, <laughs> who, uh, who basically said, uh, you know, what is appearances and what is that? And that's what they took away from the production. And, and the article uh, became about that and about the physics of perception and, and uh, the, um, the kind of the, what is it? Uh, biochemistry of perception. So it was, it was fascinating how so many different conversations were sparked by doing the production. Wonderful. Jerry. I, I want to add in that Sabine Hassenfelder is a physicist who uh, has recently did, well, somewhat recently did a book called, um, you know, Existential Physics, A Scientist's Guide to Life's Biggest Questions. And I was re reading this because it, it, she tackles things like, you know, it, uh, are, is, is everything fated to be like according to what physicists know about the universe or, 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 or you know, like, do we have free will? And, um, and, and she, she comes down kind of in the middle of the way that I'm sort of thinking of Calderon coming down uh, saying, well, well, actually everything is fated to be if you look at it from certain angles of the multiverse or whatever but um but 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 at the same time like you know um it's it it, it makes a difference to you like if you shift your angle it makes a difference to you to believe in free will because you you know that's it's it's sort of not determined because you just don't know what the answer is yet you know like i mean eventually it will be determined but 
Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in theory, you could know that, but we, in theory, you could know that if you were someone other than human, but, <laughs> but you can't really know it. So it makes no sense to think about it that way. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, we sometimes think of these, these questions as uh, musings from a, a quainter time. <laughs> but then we see that the fabric of uh, the material world is still dealing with these same questions. And it's fascinating. That's true. Well, thank you very much for doing this. I mean, I don't know whether maybe this is a good, that's a good thought to wrap up on, <laughs> but um, <laughs> and, um, uh, thanks to everybody for coming and thank you so much Joan, for doing this and um, uh, it's been recorded and so I'm going to share it with my class, mm -hmm. but also if people are interested, I suppose, you know, figure out how to, if you, if you, I'll send it to you too, so that you can use it however you'd like and um, uh, George and um, I don't know, uh, like if other people ask about it, I guess I'll we can figure that out. Sure, sure. And Bilana, thank you for reading with us. And that was fun. Oh, thank you. It was great being a part of this. I, I had my camera off at some points because like my roommate was going in and out, but I was always like here and focused, like listening. Um, I'm really glad that I came. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks so much, uh, Professor Galope, also for, for inviting you to speak. Of course, it's a very interesting topic, and besides it, it has philosophy, uh, you know, theology, but theater, which is it's always an important part, right? Uh, and that's also uh, a way of showing uh, practically that the humanities in all their forms are more important than they want us, they want us believe they are, right? Yeah. <laughs> Great, that is true. <laughs> okay, thank you, so, thank you, George. Thank you, Jerry and and Milana and everybody else. And thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.